The Terran Republic wasn't new on the galactic stage. It was just so isolated and irrelevant to most other powers and conflicts that it mostly just flew under the radar. Attempts at diplomacy with stellar nations near to them fell through early on for one reason or another. Some just refused to deal with humanity specifically for some unknown reason, or just didn't feel like humanity had anything to offer them. So the Terran Republic stayed in its little section of the galaxy, expanding and industrialising to be self-sufficient, as was a necessity for the little Hermit Republic. This need for autocracy led the Terran government to partake in social, engineering, political projects, the scale of which have never been seen before in human history. It had to fundamentally change human culture to allow for the high levels of education and population growth that would be needed for a quick and effective colonisation of their local star group, to be effective to coexist together. He needed feats of logistics so massive that it would make the colonisation of Mars look simple in comparison. It then needed to keep those colonies and terror itself to be united despite the distances to prevent them from trying to break off. It needed to have absolutely massive deployment projects to have those colonies be integral and productive pieces of the expanding republic. The administration needed to be greatly expanded and streamlined to effectively govern territories that were light years away from Sol. In the end, the Republic pulled it off. It was able to stretch its borders to the edge of the unclaimed space it had available to it. It was able to create a unified human culture that was the glue that tied its territories together, and it was able to develop those territories to be the productive parts of the Republic it needed it to be. The Terran Republic, compared to its neighbours, was still fairly small. Due to its isolated nature, few ever heard of it other than a few geopolitical buffs from the nations that neighboured it. The small region of space that the Terran Republic held became a highly developed and densely populated part of the galaxy. Still, however, the nations that bordered it refused any contact with the Terrans. As humanity learned more and more about their neighbourhood of the galaxy via listening in on local communications, it was found that the area of space humanity occupied was a buffer zone between regional powers. The reason why humanity was able to so easily colonise the area that the Terran Republic now resides was that they did not wish to provoke their rivals into a war. Funnily enough, the rivals were somewhat happy to have humanity as a buffer between them. The Terran Republic was a much more solid barrier than open space. However, this did leave the Republic in an eternal state of isolation. They were unable to even know about the goings-on outside their stellar neighbourhood. From what Terran listening posts could pick up, was due to none of the nations wanting the Republic an ally to any rival outside their little area to use the Terran as a sort of dagger pointed at their backs. So the Terrans for a long time remained as the little hermit Republic that the vast majority of the galactic population, and even governments, didn't know even existed. This however all changed with the Regari invasion. The Regari Empire was a major power in its region of space. It aimed to expand that power, and it viewed the galactic neighbourhoods the Republic resided in as a target ripe for conquest. The first time humanity even heard of the Regari was when it annexed the neighbouring Astragon Concordat. The humans could tell that the Astragons were at war. It was difficult to have such a large mobilisation. However, they didn't know who they were at war with. After the annexation of the Astragon, the Regari were expecting to rush past open space into the Aetherian Confederation. What they were not expecting was to run into a nation they didn't even know existed. The Terran Republic was an armed camp, in case the regional Cold War ever went hot, and they found themselves in the crossfire. The Regari and the Terrans were both nations that didn't know the other existed a mere few months ago. But the Regari were not going to stop their campaign just to give greetings to what they viewed as a small road bump in their way to power. The Terrans viewed the Regari as nothing more than another great endeavour to emerge from. The first Regari fleet entered the Tau Senti system and got crushed by the Terran second fleet. The Terrans began a campaign of strategic destruction on the Regari invasion forces. Decapitation strikes by the Terran Intelligence Agency rendered much of the Regari armed forces leaderless and in disarray. The destruction of important supply nodes left the Regari military personnel to be undersupplied and starving in many sections of the front. The Regari were completely unprepared 
for the numerous and fresh forces humanity had to call upon. Eventually, outside forces called for a peace settlement, which the Regari and the Terrans both accepted. The Regari accepted as they couldn't continue the war effort anymore. The Terrans accepted because they already got the concessions they wanted out of the Aetherians and Algorons for their assistance in the war. This would also be the first time humanity had any contact with the outside galaxy beyond their neighbours and the Regari. The nation that called for peace was the humanitarian state, which from what the Terrans understood to be the most powerful nation in the galaxy. They called for them to meet on one of their capital ships, the battleship Fortitude, to discuss the terms of the peace, with humanity on the winning side. Location, the Fortitude meeting room. Ilaria was waiting with her compatriots, Alicheon on the right and Machinus on the left. The three 12 foot tall humanitarians, who were all average height for their kind, wore their standard civilian powered armour that covered them all head to toe, standard attire for their kind as well. They were all waiting for the Regari and Terran delegations to get there. Finally, the Regari delegates arrived, a solemn look on their scaled faces. The Regari were a reptilian species. They were strong when compared to most other known races, though nowhere near the strength of the humanitarians. Sit, Alaria ordered. They did as told. The chairs and tables had to be lowered down to accommodate the much shorter races, so the three humanitarians would be standing for the peace talks. Not long after, three Terran delegates came in. They wore a sealed suit that covered their features, though their posture and shape seemed rather familiar to the humanitarians. The Terrans just stared up at the three humanitarians, or almost certainly on their concealed faces. You may take your helmets off if you wish, Terrans. This room's atmosphere was said to be hospitable to both Terrans and Rugari, Machinus said. Oh, um, thanks, one of the Terrans said, reaching for his helmet and unlatching it, the other Terran delegates following suit. The now helmetless Terrans revealed a face with features all too familiar to humanitarians, who looked at the three Terrans with shock. Now, where do we sit? The Terran was cut off with Aletian yelling. Is this some kind of sick joke? The Aletian was filled with rage, his voice dripping with it. Um, what? The Terrans asked with a hint of fear in their voice. Calm down, Aletian, Alaria ordered. But calm down, Alaria ordered again more firmly. Alaria looked to the Terran delegates and walked around the table towards them. The Regari delegates were watching anxiously as the 12 foot tall powered armored giant moved. Alaria walked until she loomed over the Terrans. She got on her knees and seemed to be inspecting them closely. Magnus, could you call for a doctor? I want these three examined. Alaria asked her colleague. Yes, Alaria, Magnus said as he died for said doctor in his communicator. May we ask why you are calling a doctor? One of the Terrans asked. Just confirming what we believe to already know, little one, there is no need to be afraid, Alaria said, switching from a professional voice to that of a more caring one. No offence, ma'am, but we would rather not be called little ones. It's degrading, the Terrans said. Hmm, we shall see, Alaria said. Finally, the humanitarian doctor arrived. He wore white armour and had a symbol on his shoulder that the Terrans assumed to be a mark of his profession. Well, hello, little ones. Um, how did you get in here? The humanitarian doctor asked. Um, well, we are the delegation sent by the Terran Republic to hash out a peace agreement with the Regari, one of the delegates explained. <laughs> sure you are, little one. May you take blood samples? Alaria asked. Yeah, sure. Come here, little ones. The humanitarian doctor said, putting his doctor's bag down and taking out what appeared to be a syringe. Hey, wait. Hold on, we are never great to- Ugh. All three of the Terran's arms rose in front of them, wrists pointed upwards. The humanitarian doctor tussed at them. What the fuck? Why can't I put my arm down? What the hell is this? The Terrans were yelling in surprise. The Regari chuckled a bit to see their enemy in such a panic, 
but a glare from Elysian silenced them. Come on, little ones, you'd never heard of Sionks before? Didn't your parents ever tell you about them? Asked the doctor. We have never seen or heard of Sionks being real before, sir. Please release my arm. How strange, the doctor said. Strange indeed, Alaria added. The doctor tore one of the Terran suits open at the wrist that was held out. All right, this might sting a little, the humanitarian doctor said, inserting the syringe. The doctor repeated the process with the other two Terrans. The doctor released the Terrans from his silent grip. They immediately moved to rub their wrists. The Republic will hear about this incident, one of the delegates warned. The doctor ignored them as he grabbed another instrument from his bag. The doctor inserted one of the files of blood into the machine, to which it gave off test results. Oh. Oh no. The doctor said, like he had just discovered some terrible truth. What is it? One of the Terrans asked. Oh, nothing, little one. The doctor said back. To that, the Terrans groaned. The doctor tested the other vials to both. He gave a disheartened response. The doctor walked over to the still kneeling Inaria, motioning for her to stand up. The doctor whispered something into her power suit's audio receptor. Alaria gave out a gasp. All three of them? Alaria asked. I'm afraid so, the doctor responded. Now hold on. What the hell are you not telling us? You invited us here to discuss peace negotiations, and now you take blood tests without our consent. What the hell is going on? One of the Terrans demanded. The powered armoured giants looked down to the relatively small man. If I may ask, could you do a reading on them as well? We need to know what we are dealing with here. Elaria asked the doctor. I agree. Alright, you three, prepare yourselves. First reading always feels weird, the doctor told the Terrans. The Terrans clutched their head in pain as a migraine set in, but it left as soon as it came. Oh, the doctor said with a mix of shock and belief. What's oh? Alaria asked. While these three aren't lying, they really are delegations sent by the Terran Republic to negotiate a peace agreement with the Rigari, the Doctor said. It's just the Terrans are all children infected with the Zelian disease. The other humanitarians in the room gasped at the Doctor's explanation. If I had to guess, these are the descendants of those who were on that hospital ship we lost contact with all those millennia ago. This explains why they don't know about Sionix. They died too young to ever develop them. I think we should inform the families of the long deceased they may still want custody of the descendants. The doctor shifted his gaze to the Rigari delegates. So congratulations, Rigari. You lost a war to children with a debilitating sickness. It would be funny if it wasn't so sad, the doctor stated. What evidence do you have of any of this? said one of the Terrans. Elaria quickly unlocked her helmet and revealed a face so similar to that of a human one, the main difference being instead of eyes. She had glowing blue orbs. What the fuck? The Terran stated. You don't suppose we can keep diplomatic relations normal, right? Another Terran delegate asked. No, the families of those long deceased have a right, by humanitarian state law, to the descendants of those dead due to Zelysian disease. What will be difficult is find out who has rights to who, though we will eventually find out, said Ilaria. Crap, the Terran said in unison. Doctor, please escort these little ones to the intensive care unit, Alaria said. With pleasure, Alaria, the doctor said. What about the negotiations? One of the Rigari delegates asked. Alaria turned to them. We shall contact our government about the change in situation and then, well, let's just say our terms will be a lot less forgiving than the little ones. The Rigari gulped in fear. All the achievements of the Terran Republic or the outstanding feats of industry, organization, and military prowess, in the end, they were all just child's play. Humanitarian State Archive Zalician Disease The Zalician disease is characterized by it exclusively affecting humanitarian children. Muscle degradation, gradual loss of vision, mental disorder, premature development of reproductive organs, and an early death. Those with the disease, if not administered the proper treatment to cure it, will not be able to live past the age of even 200 if put under intensive care. Before a cure was developed, Zalesian disease accounted for 98% of all humanitarian child deaths. 
the development of the cure for it was deemed one of the most important discoveries in humanitarian history. Humanitarian State Archive Ilocon Hospital Ship Incident In the year BB87, the hospital ship Ilocon, carrying over 1,000 humanitarian children with the Zilisian disease, disappeared. Parents of the lost children demanded efforts to find the missing vessel, but every search party returned empty-handed. BC 2187, edit. Hospital ship Ilocon was found to have landed on the planet known both as Earth and Terra by its current inhabitants. The children appear to have survived the crash and have been the first in a long line of short-lived generations on the planet. At one point, a generation of descendants calling themselves Terrans and Humans formed a planetary government that would expand to its local star groups. The Republic had been isolated and concealed by its neighbors in order to try and keep it neutral. It had acted as a sort of buffer state between regional powers. During the Regari War of Aggression, the term Republic had battled with the encroaching Regari Empire as its military annex to Republic's neighbor, the Ashagong Concordat. The term Republic had a long string of military victories which devastated the Regari Empire's ability to make war in that section of the galaxy. The war revealed the existence of the Terran Republic. It was revealed to humanitarian officials of what the Terrans truly were during attempted peace negotiations on the battleship known as the Fortitude. The Terrans were sent to the Fortitude's intensive care unit. Their genetic history was analyzed and revealed to have been descended from multiple humanitarian families. They have since agreed on a joint custody arrangement. The revelation of the Terrans actually just being children with the Zalician disease created a large anti-Rigari sentiment among the humanitarian population. The Rigari Empire has since been put under humanitarian occupation. The fate of the Rigari people have yet to be determined. The Terran Republic has rejected all humanitarian offers for peaceful integration, stating that whoever your kids were are long dead. We are our own nation and people now. Please leave us alone. The statement of non-compliance caused Admiral Decoris Alson to make a public statement. As all red-blooded humanitarians, it is our responsibility that we must bring our sick little ones back. They may not wish it, but for their sake, and the sake of the families that lost their loved ones so long ago, it pains me to say this, but we will not negotiate with the mentally unfit. Multiple fleets of ships carrying psionic specialists and system-disabling weaponry have since parted for the Terra Republic, in the hopes of making the capture of the territory as bloodless as possible. The Terra Republic was reported to have mobilized its military assets in a show of defiance. Though the Republic's victory in the upcoming conflict is deemed very unlikely. The Terra Republic's military, though, is considered to be one of, if not the most powerful in the region after its victory over the Regari. In comparison to the humanitarian state's military, was described by one humanitarian general to be nothing but child's play.